<laughs> Sorry, we were having some tech snags here, but this is, I would love to introduce Jonathan Fitzgordon, who is the creator of the Core Walking Program. You've written two fabulous books, which one of which has the favorite title of all time, my favorite title of all time, So As Release Party. And I have attended some of your So As Release Parties, which are super good times. And also the, I want to make sure I get it in the right order, Sciatica Piriformis Syndrome book. And Jonathan is also going way back, really my first real yoga teacher, back when you ran Brooklyn Yoga, when I was crawling out of my very much improved, but still very broken body. I did a lot of privates with Jonathan and got to have the amazing opportunity to know you as you were beginning, just like the infancy of starting the core walking program way back and to see how you were putting it together. And I personally found just enormous benefit for that in my own body, both with my yoga work with you, but also the core walking method. So thank you so much for talking to us. Um, you have such a good body nerd mind. So I always love to pick your brain about whatever you're on about at any given time. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. You were actually one of the very first people that went through the walking program. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was an amazing learning experience putting people through it in the very beginning because it's, it's not that I didn't know what I was doing, but I was figuring out what I was doing as I was going along. And it was an amazing thing, like your issues and, and meeting th people with different issues really uh, opened my eyes and made me start going, oh, wow, I have to ap approach everyone completely differently because your issue was so different than the next person that walked in the door. And right. as a yoga teacher, you didn't, I didn't really need to do that so much. As a yoga teacher, I can just approach a group and offer something to a group and, you know, what people got individually was fine. But then when you start working on trying to change like an intrinsic movement pattern, to really get into an individual and their needs and, and why they ended up the way they did uh, was a really exciting and, and um, has been incredibly fulfilling. It's almost 10 years already. Yeah, gosh, that's, wow, time flies. <laughs> I can't believe that was 10 years ago. Um, so there are several things that you talk about on a regular basis, and I guess we'll just kind of see what we wind up riffing on. I know I already interviewed you before, Soma Happy, which is my private practice, before my private practice website blog turned into Fascia Freedom Fighters, did a great interview with you on the SOAS. People keep saying to me, get the SOAS guy back. You're the SOAS guy. I think you've probably been the SOAS guy for a long time. Um, so you have a lot of a wealth of knowledge about the SOAS, how it affects movement. Also, obviously, uh, sciatica, piriformis syndrome, since you wrote the books on that. But we were talking earlier, I mean, there are a few hallmarks of, of you that I always think about, your teaching. <laughs> um, few catchphrases, I don't mean to call them catchphrases, but that I'm thinking of is stick your butt out, go ape. And just you have these ways, particularly in a yoga classroom, where I think we live in a culture where people are trying to constantly uh, sort of battle their bodies into uprightness, uh, taking on that sort of military or, or ballet dancer effortful posture. And you're really talking to people in a very different way about how they can inhabit their bodies. So there are a million ways you can go with that, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on all of that. You know, the idea for me was, <clears throat> I love calling them catchphrases actually. And I think I love the use of the catchphrase because, you know, I love Rolfing. And I love uh, Alexander and I love Feldenkrais and there's nothing in the world of body work that I don't really appreciate and love. It's just that I, found, I find a lot of it was very, very, very subtle mm. and for someone who understood their body or was ready to go deeper um, right away. Yeah. And so when I started the walking program, I really wanted to figure out how do I make this as simple as possible? And so for me, the idea of stick your butt out is a very simple instruction. And I get grief for that, which is really funny because people, I'll say, just stick, it, stick your butt out. And in truth, I don't say stick it out how far. I don't say, you know, I don't give very specific instructions. So it's a general instruction, but I do think in everyone tucks their pelvis up. And that's yeah. an argument people can have. And I just think everyone I meet, and what's funny is, Sometimes I'll get a body worker will come in for a, a session. Uh, someone, Ralph came in last week. We were doing some trade. 
And sometimes I think, oh, this person is going to show up and have perfect posture and they'll right. have it all together. And yet they come in and they're tucked under like everybody else. Yeah. And the first thing when I went to do the trade with this rolfer, within minutes, she started, we were doing foot stuff. And she, within minutes, she said, oh, you don't practice what you preach. Your lateral line is all a mess and you walk on the outside of your feet. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, no, I totally don't practice what I preach. I'm trying to practice what I preach. Right. So for me, the idea of simple is the best approach I can use. And one of my favorite phrases is go eight. Yeah. And one of the things is very often I don't, um, I don't tell people to go eight. I, I, I put people, I make them stand, I make them do it. I'm waiting for them to actually say, well, I feel like an eight. <laughs> right. And when, they, when they say that, I'm like, you're fixed. You're yeah. Really, you're in really good shape. Once you get that sense, so that gets into why we're all stuck in the places we're stuck. And my main take is we're all tucked under in the pelvis, hyperextended in the knees, leaning backwards in the upper body, which crunches and shortens the quadratus and the psoas and all of those things. And I, it becomes an amazing perceptive thing where let's say I'm teaching a, a yoga class with 15 people and I put everyone in Tadasana and I say, stand up straight. And they all stand up straight. And I'll take the time to walk around to all 15 of the right, to <laughs> yeah. all 15 of those people and make move them from where they are, which is leaning backwards and tucked under, mm -hmm. to standing up straight. Then I'll walk to the front of the room and I'll say, now go back to where you were. Mm -hmm. And then they, and I, it's a fun thing for me to watch visually. They all, every, the whole room just leans backwards. Yeah. And I say, not only did you lean backwards, so you tuck the pelvis and crunch the quadratus, right? You're crunching your lower back muscles. But in truth, you have to then figure out what the perception issue is. Yeah. You are perceiving straight as something that's leaning backwards. Yeah. And right away, that's where it becomes fun for me. Right, the, the stick your butt out, the go eight, that's really good stuff. But the idea of you have to change your perception of yourself in order to change your physical self yeah. is so wrapped up in who we are and, and how we want to go about fixing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so essentially my main thing is that uh, I'm a guide. I can't fix anybody. I don't think anybody can fix anybody. And you know how I love Rolfers, but I don't think Rolfers fix people. I think Rolfers facilitate people fixing themselves. Hallelujah. But that's not, yeah, but I don't think that's in dialogue enough, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I love my chiropractor, but I tell people, you go to the chiropractor and they adjust you, and then you have to leave and figure out how to keep the adjustment. If not, you're addicted to your chiropractor, and you go back every week. Absolutely. And, and but I actually, so I, it, it's not to complain about practitioners, but I actually think it needs to be more of a dialogue of I am someone to help you fix yourself. Yes. And that's the walking program. And and honestly, I still want, I go to Rolfers and chiropractors mm -hmm. and I love massage. There's nothing I don't want to do, but I really am uh, of the belief that people have to fix themselves. And it's not that I don't like touching people, but I realized early on as a yoga teacher, my, my strength is in my eye and seeing and watching people and telling them what to do with what I see for yeah. me works much better than manipulating people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just big giant hallelujah to all of that. I mean, it's one of the <clears throat> it is the driving reason for for me for creating Fascia Freedom Fighters is that I want people to get in here on their own and find a way to to better inhabit their bodies. And that journey takes many forms, which involves practitioners on the same way. I have, you know, I just I love my DO. Ugh. Lenore is the best. Like I have certain people who I love to work with, but, um, for me, staying well is really about, you know, my inner practice and getting to know my own body. So, um, yeah, hoping to bring that information more to the masses. And I would like to just back up a little, a little bit and talk about, because I, in my practice, when clients come in, I, you know, I know I see the flat lumbar spine, the tucked pelvis all the time. And of course, because I think it's a cultural problem, I think it's primarily because of sitting. And when I tell them this is an aberrant pattern that's causing you trouble, the look of shock, you know, it's just, uh, it's like I've offended some core value of theirs, which tells them, and what they're telling me is, I am trying to tuck my pelvis more. 
oh, I thought, I thought I needed to tuck my pelvis more. And it's like, no, you know, so it makes me crazy. So I would just love to hear from you. What do you think the tucked pelvis is about? Why, how did we even get this idea that it's a good thing for a body? Everyone thinks they need to tuck their pelvis more. And yet what everyone needs is to re-embrace a lumbar curve. So any thoughts on what's going on with that? You know, I have lots of theories that are completely, have no basis in fact that I know of. But I really believe something happened, whether, I, I don't, I'm, I mean, I'm really making it up, but something in the aerobics practice, um, buns of steel, like <laughs> yeah. the bond, a whole concept shifted uh -huh. in the, the public's idea of what working out was, and I think that's part of it. But I also think that it, it's a purely a medical thing, which is, and I don't know how it became prevalent, but uh, you hurt your back and you go to a doctor and they say, literally, make your butt stronger mm. and make your abs stronger. So they basically tell you to do things that I just don't think have, have served people's back pain. So on a certain level, 30 years ago or whatever, someone goes to the doctor with back pain and the doctor goes, well, if you tuck your pelvis under, you're going to elongate the bottom of your spine and create more space. Right. On a certain level, there's logic to that, right? Right. And then it, it takes hold and it becomes part of the, just part of the fabric. Mm. So, and I, so I have no idea if that's true, but I really do believe that at a certain point, doctors started saying, tuck your pelvis to alleviate your back pain and uh, workout methods became about tucking the pelvis and, and getting that harder, yeah. stronger butt. Yeah, and I think, and then, sorry, I was just I gonna say, I'm, the, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, I, another one of my main theories is simply we do it because we can. Yeah. In that my whole psoas thing is, you know, we didn't, the psoas doesn't do anything in, in the cow or in the horse. And the, we came up to stand, and the psoas creates the lumbar curve with the first upright beings. And I just think we lean backwards simply because we can. Yeah. I don't know. I, in a lot of ways, I don't know why else, you know, um, other than the, the perception stuff aside. But simply because we have the curve, we fall backwards into it. And that tucks the pelvis under as well. Right. So tell people some of the goodies that they would, some of the benefits they would reap from sticking their butt out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, the main thing they would really, they would get is to relax it, right? Yeah. You know, we are tight ass people and mm -hmm. we need to learn to let go. And that is the mo most important thing. And I talk to people about, and so one of, one of the things that I say, I try to, I want to teach people anatomy, right? So that they know how their body works. But I also want them to start tapping into feeling what their body does. And, mm -hmm. and to be completely honest, I am not a feeling person, you know, like, when I go to the chiropractor, I can't tell you what she's doing in my body. When I know I have clients that literally can tell me everything she's doing in their bodies, right? So everyone has different sensitivities. Sure. But you can really start to see how you feel. So the, the, the classic one I tell people is the next time you're in a store and you are online behind a cashier, and I'm a New Yorker, so no one ever moves fast enough for me. Right. But as I go online and they move slower or start chatting with the person, my butt starts gripping. Uh -huh. Like literally, I can feel that where does the tension in my body goes? It goes right into my pelvis. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I tuck more, but I feel that tension muscularly. And because I focus on that so much, I now know when I get into a place of that tension, I can now say, oh, just feel your butt and relax it. Mm -hmm. And that, that relaxation brings nervous system ease. Yeah. So a lot of it is get to know your responses, right? So sticking out your pelvis, one, gives you access to releasing and relaxing your pelvis. Um, and it also gives you, and it starts to give you an awareness of where, you, where your body uh, lies in space. Right. The, you know, it's funny because I, um, I wrote a post this morning about the talus, the talus bone in the ankle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put it up on Facebook, my, my little description was, you know how I, I usually say it's all about the psoas. Um, well, today it's all about the talus. <laughs> right. you know? well, there are all these incredibly important areas in the body, but there, um, there's a book I loved, uh, Taking Root to Fly by Irene Dowd. Mm -hmm. She's an anatomist in New York who I just love, and I'm going to be writing a post about her. 
And I think it's maybe even the first line of her book. It's the pelvis is the hub of a wheel. Uh -huh. And that's been a phrase, you know, that I've just used from the first, the minute I read that. And that's how I learn a lot. Like I read one line and from there on I, t I use that. And so to me, it's the pelvis. And if your pelvis is not in the right place, your, your rib cage can't be in the right place, yeah. your ankle can't be in the right place, your psoas can't be in the right place, so that um, all of these things add up to what happens when I stick my butt. Yeah. Right? And I, really, you get release of your butt. You also get access to your central channel. You get access to Kegel muscles. You know, I think uh, Kegel muscles are a huge... Um, Kegel exercises are a fun controversy these days. There are these anti-Kegels people out there. And I'm, I'm all for their anti-Kegelness, except I just think people do Kegels wrong. Right. And if you find your pelvis in the right place, your Kegel muscle, your Kegel exercises can easily be done correct. Right, right. And just for those watching, Kegels meaning pelvic floor muscles. Pelvic floor lifts. Um, yeah, and I just want to talk about a little bit, and you talked about this already, that you use broad, you paint with broad strokes when you're teaching, you know? So stick your butt out. It's not play with, you know, within a few millimeters. And one of the things that I find that I come up against with people embracing that our spine has, is built out of our whole body, really, a myriad of S-curves, and not we're not a stack of blocks where we're trying to get the flattest spine possible, uh, which would be really a uh, very painful and unpleasant setup, actually. But what I talk with a lot of people is to play with this stuff, looking at themselves from the side in a full length mirror, because I find that when people stick their butt out, even a millimeter, <laughs> in our culture, we're so like butt phobic, especially men. In Latin cultures, men aren't as butt phobic, they're not as terrified of their own butts. But they feel like they're walking around like this crazy baboon creature and they don't. So it's that proprioception again, that sense of what is my body actually doing? It's just way off. And so when you're trying to embrace having normal, healthy, supportive spinal curves, do you come up against that a lot where there's this cultural bias of hiding the butt? <laughs> we want it to be made of steel, but hidden. <laughs> that, well, What's amazing is I come up with that all the time, but for endlessly different reasons. Okay. Which is, that's what's interesting to me, you know. So, like, when I definitely, I begin teaching people in general, but the minute I find someone who can get subtle, I'll get really subtle. Sure. Right? And um, so I'm not a psychologist. But I really do believe that a lot of this body stuff is purely about the psychology of who I am, what I am. And that gets into very strange things like you're a ballet, you were a ballet student your whole mm -hmm. life. And you have the, the posture of a ballet student. Sure. And the thing is that your memories of childhood are blissful about your time in the ballet studio. And then you meet somebody like me who goes, you know, you kind of got to get rid of those patterns. Mm. But deep in the psyche, those are your patterns. Those are the patterns that are the memories of the time you love. Yeah. So I think there's actually a very interesting process of telling somebody change. Mm. Right? And the opposite is with you are deeply attached to your mother and you walk like her and I say change. But then there's the opposite of you have deep fear for your mother and you walk like her and I say change. Right. So like there is – it's – even though there's a certain general thing everyone needs to change, sure. there's this amazing psychology of why our bodies turned out the way they did and how we can go about being kind to ourselves in the willingness to change. Sure. But that, that's, that's the, the, the most fascinating thing is, you know, mostly I'm working with people in pain. Mm -hmm. So if I meet someone, let's say at a cocktail party and everyone loves to chat about walking and you're not in pain, why would you believe me? Yeah, right. Right? From leaning backwards to standing up straight, and that's all fine, right? But they're like, who cares? But if you're in pain, yeah. and I get used to and you go, oh, look, uh, I have more space in my lower back. Right. Then, then you're going to, the incentive is there for change. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I met this, I'm working with an 82-year-old woman and her 83-year-old husband, right? Her 83-year-old husband is in unbelievable shape, and he does everything wrong. Uh-huh. And I say I, I, was, I was talking about sleeping. How do you sleep? On my stomach. 
I said, oh my God, that's the worst thing for you. He's in 83 years, never had a back pain in my life. Like, that's incredible. <laughs> right. Uh, I said, what are you attributed to? He goes, I eat hot dogs off the street every day. Right? Oh, so to be honest, am I going to tell that guy to stop sleeping on his stomach? No. Right? What's the point? Right. So everybody is so different. And I don't understand why that guy is able to sleep on his stomach for 82 years without a problem. That's, right. That makes no sense to me, you know? So, and again, that's what's fun about my work is that everybody is so individual. And I think, you know, from a, a body work hands-on perspective, you're not looking at the psychology necessary, necessarily of how the body turned out that way. So I feel like in movement, um, you can really approach that. And culturally, it gets into so many different things because I, you know, I meet women who I am literally on a certain say, good look, just go out there and strut your stuff, mm -hmm. you know, show yourself to the world. But that there's fear in that. Sure. And I, and who am I to say, but I'm like, really, I don't think anyone's looking at you. I don't <laughs> Not think in New York. <laughs> you're down, wait, I don't think you're walking down the street and everyone is, especially if I tell you to walk a little weird, it's New York. Right. You know, nobody <laughs> cares. But we have all these bizarre perceptions. It's actually why I like working with couples a lot. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like if two people work together and look at each other and reinforce, it can be really, really beneficial. Sure. But it's weird. Um, you know, Buddhism, right? The first truths of Buddhism is life is suffering and, and suffering is due to wanting. And to me, it is, it is all about fear of change. Mm -hmm. That there is nothing, nothing driving our show more than fear, and that fear is a fear of change, and you know a lack of permanence in an impermanent world. And I really believe, without getting too spiritual, all of the walking and movement patterns is really wrapped up in that. Sure. That we get, we, and it's just like you know, why does the race, why does a little kid with a racist father turn out to be a racist? Because we know where we come from, right. and our bodies are where we come from. But you get, you get to choose as an adult if you want to change that. Right. Know? Or not. Yeah, <laughs> or not. Uh, my son, who's just turned five, walks with the worst hyperextension I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I told him this. And then he told my wife, he goes, look, mommy, look, my, daddy told me I walk funny. And, you know, a week later, he's still doing it. I said, I, I thought you were going to stop doing that. He goes, no, why? And I said, well, I told you it's not so good. He goes, yeah, but I like it. I reckon, right, right. You know? you've decided to like it. You decided to like it. So that's yes. an interesting thing about who we are and why we are. And, and that's weight issues and body issues sure. and perception issues. But um, no one has as big a butt as they think. No, I know. It makes me crazy. <laughs> like, your and butt's fine. Get a mirror. It's all fine. You like it. Right. right. <laughs> And I just want to talk a little bit about, because I think it's really interesting. So you have developed and you teach a walking program, how people can walk better, basically. And the people, like you just said, the people who you're working with who are coming to you are people who are in pain. They're coming to see you to get out of pain. And I think a lot of people really don't put those two things together in their head. If I change my walk, my pain will get better. So I'm just wondering if you can address that a little bit and what you teach in the walking program and also what kinds of people or pain patterns come to see you? The, um, you know, it's called the core walking program. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you have to walk correctly, whatever that is, but you also need muscles to support that walking. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, um, and I've seen it with my children, right? I taught them how to tie their shoe. I taught them how to zip their jacket. Mm -hmm. And when they stood up to walk, I didn't say anything. Right. People, <laughs> Little kids get up to walk, and no one really teaches them to walk. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they go to athletics, and they'll teach them technique for athletics, right? But they, they don't get taught how to walk. Mm -hmm. And that became really the initial thing of, well, why should anyone walk well yeah. when no one taught them how? And I've had um, – so most of the people that I, I get, is it's joint pain. It's uh, lower back pain, hip pain, knee pain, shoulder pain. Mm -hmm. um, and what's funny is you're really only coming to me as a place of last resort because I think people think walking is this just strange 
concept, you know. Sure. So the people that are coming to me have usually been to many doctors and many physical therapists, you know. Mm -hmm. And I have very simple ways of, of um, changing them, right? There are very specific techniques. It's, a, it's technically like a five to eight course, eight session course. And we start with the psoas and we, the pelvis and then we do the feet and the knees and you, know, you work up the body. But in truth, I'm trying to figure out um, mental ways of showing them how to move better. So let's say somebody is a tennis player. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, show me how you set up for a serve. Mm -hmm. right? And um, right away, that is better. That pattern of movement and, and being is better than the way they walk down the street. Sure. Right? Uh, or I was working with a hockey player a couple of weeks ago, and I, I said, are you good? And he said, yes. I said, so now you're in the corner. Show me how you skate out. Right? And he leans forward and gets deep into his core and, skate and powers out towards the room. And I said, now walk. And literally, the exact opposite happens. Mm. His legs go first, then his body goes last. And I said, so just walk like you skate. And I have done that with so many people. Mm. Like, you have something that you've applied yourself to technically, and for whatever reason, you didn't apply it to the way you walk. Right. And that, that alone is a way. And so in a lot of ways, it's about getting them into the front of the body. Right. Right. I think everyone moves to the back of the body. Everyone is tight in the back of the body. Go up the whole back. You've got tight Achilles, tight calves, tight hamstrings, tight butts, tight quadratus, tight erectors, tight suboccipitals, like it, 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 the whole back body. <laughs> so we're walking that way and we're moving that way. Yeah. And everything I'm trying to do in my yoga class, in my walking class, in any exercise I do or teach, it's get into the front body. Yeah. Um, which gets into unbelievable stuff because uh, there are no rules for this, right? So I just had somebody who came in who was having back pain and had obviously very tight psoas. Both psoas were really tight mm -hmm. and this person did a lot of crunches as well, mm -hmm. right? So the tight psoas, and I said, and, and he thought he was fat. And I'm like, dude, you're not fat. I showed him my belly. I said, this is belly fat, right? Mm -hmm. It jiggled. Look, put your hand on your belly. It's rigid and hard, right. right? So I said, there are a lot of things going on. You lean backwards, which means your rectus abdominis, your front, your belly is too long, mm -hmm. right? Your quadratus is too short, and your front is too long. Mm -hmm. And that's just like part of your pattern. But... Your psoas are tight, which is creating this problem, but it's also shoving your abdominal contents forward mm -hmm. into your uh, rectus, into your rectus abdominis. Mm -hmm. So if I was to tell that person, that guy, start doing sit-ups to shorten the front body, mm -hmm. he's actually going to create more congestion yeah. in the, his middle to do it. So. That's where it has to become a very specific thing. Like there are the yeah. general things of get into your the front of your body, fall forward, walking is falling, use your psoas because most people don't use the psoas, but then it gets into there are always, uh, you know, dicey situations where people in pain are there for a reason. Sure. When they're in pain, they have problems that are causing it and interrupting the ability to heal. Mm -hmm. So then it can, get, it can get a lot more subtle in terms of how to get them into the front body, but it's almost always about getting into the front body. Yeah, yeah. So what are some of the ways that you get people into a front body or, or what? Because I know that, you know, psoas is one of those muscles generally that has this kind of like mystical <laughs> quality. And it's also, I mean, just plain hard for people to understand because it's tucked away, you know, it paints the front of our lumbars, it sits behind our viscera, the, oh, but then it crosses the pelvis, oh, but then it attaches on the front of the inner thigh, you know, so I think it's just this mysterious thing, and it's also not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, my bicep's tight, I'm going to stretch my bicep. There's not really the like, oh, yeah, you just got to stretch out your psoas. So what are some ways that you get people into that, or just kind of talking a little to, like, what is this thing, the psoas? <laughs> I totally... I am, I am mystified by the mystery of the psoas mm -hmm. because I have people who I have literally trained in teacher trainings come up to me a year later and say, so where is the psoas? Yeah, it's just and hard I'm for like, people to get. So you, you listen to me talk about it for months, right? right? 
So I don't, I don't honestly understand that. I'm fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. And that's to be about, we don't want to go. Sometimes we don't want to go to places we don't want to go sure. and, and learn about these things, right? Um, and I think that what's so weird is therefore you have to honor it. If, if it's this weird thing that people don't understand and sort of don't want to understand, mm -hmm. you have to just kind of figure out how to um, let that be, if that's the deal. Mm -hmm. So my main thing, my main exercise is not a core strengthener, it's a psoas release. Mm -hmm. It's um, constructive rest position. Yeah. Ten years later, I cannot believe how profoundly effective constructive rest position is for people to, to let go of the psoas to create space in the hips and the body and so in, it's a core walking program and that everyone needs more core strength i meet very few people that are really strong enough yeah i really i don't meet many people who are really strong enough but the other piece of that is you need to have a happy released so as mm -hmm. and that just become makes things complicated right sure um you can people should stretch their so as there's nothing wrong with stretching their so as there are really good so as stretches what's weird is you don't ever want to feel a so as stretch right <laughs> so when, people, when people go and they go oh i'm stretching my so as i'm like you should be unhappy about that right <laughs> and when you go to the other side and don't feel it then you know you're in trouble yeah right because you know you're you're in an imbalance and it gets into all these weird things that I, I work with people and I'm in class and they'll say it hurts and I'm like but well, and they'll come they'll go into a back bend mm -hmm. and they'll go up and they'll go it hurts and I'll say okay so what hurts my back and I'm like well what part of your back right if it's in your spine it's not a good thing yeah but if it's in your muscles alongside the spine they're probably just trying to figure out how to work yeah right it doesn't mean they're always working correctly mm -hmm. Right, but they do need to figure out how to work. So it, it endlessly gets back into people getting to know themselves, people learning their anatomy, people learning how the body works. So one of the, in in the walking, one of the first things I'll say is walk around, and everybody usually wears their shoes out on the outside of their shoes, right? And that's the back body that's living on the outside. That's our hyperextension. It's our tuck pelvis. And then I can I can either say uh, walk this way. Right, or I can say, well, how would you walk on the inside of your shoe? Without giving any other instructions, just say, if I'm telling you that you're and you feel that you're walking on the outside of the shoe, how would you walk on the inside of the shoe? Mm -hmm. And they they'll figure it out. You stick your butt out, right? right? And then I can say, well, now that you're walking on the inside of the shoe, what else? What else do you feel when you do that? So endlessly, it's this kind of tactile kind of approach to figure out if you if you learn your anatomy mm -hmm. you know your foot is supposed to place down on the inside it's going to place down that way right and if you know you have four abdominal muscles and one of them is more important or tends to be uh, you know unused compared to the others you're going to work that one more yeah you know when it gets to the abs and transverse and, and rectus um that gets complicated you know that's not particularly simple stuff uh but I think people have to learn it. Sure. That's one of my, my classic things is you come in and you're, if you're a photographer, I'll say, great, you know, you, you know how to take apart a camera? And they'll say yes. I'm like, great, well, learn how to take apart yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Become an expert on you and it will serve you for the rest of your life. Yeah, absolutely. We've we've got these things, we've got these bodies kicking around. <laughs> Might as well figure them out so that we can enjoy living inside of them. And amazingly, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who've never needed to go to you or to the chiropractor, yeah. right? I'm a little shocked because <laughs> so I really much. think that, yeah, cause it, but I, I watch people. I've also had people come in once, literally came in once, right? And I was a little annoyed. This is a friend of mine. And uh, we, the, the session ends and I said, okay, so, you know, if you want to come back, he goes, no, I got it. <laughs> and I said, like, and, and, and I'm into it. You know, I don't want people coming back. And, and I got a little of miffed, and I said, oh, really? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I got it. And I had to step back and go, well, okay, maybe, maybe he did. Yeah. You know, what I mean? that's what I'm trying to tell people. And, and I, I haven't seen him since, but I actually think he got it. You know, and I had this other, a doctor who came in, and I was really into him because I wanted to, like, get a testimonial from him. <laughs> right. And he came in, he had this severe back pain, 
and for years. And he came in, came in three times, and then never came back. Mm. And I, of course, am all insecure and, you know, thought, like, it didn't work and he hated me and blah, blah, blah. So, and I wanted a testimonial and I, I emailed him and I said, what's up? He goes, oh, I have no pain. <laughs> You're like, and good to know. <laughs> That's great. And he goes, you know, I'll come back if I ever get pain. And I, that to me is the point of the program. Amen. That's yeah. the idea. That uh, I just put up a, a meme on Facebook. Patient, heal thyself. The whole game is that our job is to facilitate how people can heal themselves. And on a certain level, a practitioner might get all wrapped up and say, uh, I have to make a living. I need these people to come to me. But, you know, my take is yeah. the world is filled the with so many big. broken yeah. people. Uh, <laughs> there are more than enough to keep us working. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I just think that the more and more people can figure out their own stuff, their own maintenance and, and really be on top of that, the better for sure. Totally. And I'm, you know, I'm the biggest proponent of that in the world. And I still see my my body workers, not that much, but you know, I still, I still see people a handful of times a year. Uh, so, my, sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say, just on, as an aside, my sister has really severe scoliosis. Uh -huh. That's like her story. And her daughter, who's like a hip hop dancer with an unbelievable core, mm. was just diagnosed with mild scoliosis. Huh. And like in the initial, they start talking about things we can do, right, for repair and fix. And the girl's 16. Yeah. And I happened to be there when she came home from the doctor. I'm like, I don't think you need to do anything. Yeah. I think you're in amazing shape. You are unbelievable. She does these, I watch her core workout. Like, she can do anything. I'm like, Doc, you don't have to do what they're telling you in these weird, strangely invasive processes. Yeah. Get, don't, you know, believe them and trust them, but do your research and really figure it out. Yeah. And if she's, you know, she's in there, she's in her own core, <laughs> that's like an amazing place to start from whatever journey that scoliosis takes for her. Um, so just, you know, wrapping up a little bit, people at home, we're talking so much about how people can work on their own stuff. So is there anything in particular, like you feel like this is my favorite, I hate to be so like glib, but like my favorite one-stop shopping or my favorite thing people can do to play with at home and see if it makes an impact in their pattern or in their pain. Well, that's an interesting thing. I actually, you know, just to go back to constructive rest, right? I really do think constructive rest is a strange thing yeah. because you just sit there for a half hour and see what happens. Yeah. But oddly it's benign. But on a on a on a different level, everyone learns differently. Mm -hmm. Everyone uh, likes things different ways, you know. Sure. And so I think it's about learning about your body. And if you figure it out, like, I like reading, go buy an anatomy book. If you like watching, get Nova on the brain or the body, uh -huh. you know. But to me, that's an interesting thing is how am I going to, how do I learn best? So you either learn by touching, by seeing, by hearing. And then how am I going to apply that to starting to learn about my body so that I just know how to use my body better? Yeah. And what's amazing to me is how much money people spend on medical that they do not need to be spending if they know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so two points. First of all, for everyone watching, I will link to a post I did earlier on constructive rest after the last time I interviewed you. because I, You know, a lot of people don't know what it is. And it's the kind of thing that is really non-invasive, really easy to do and play with at home. So I'll, I'll link to a video for those of you who are wanting to actually play with that and try it out. Um, and I had another piece I was going to say. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I think what you're getting at is learn about what's happening on the inside in whatever way that makes sense to you. Spend some time. It's not like everybody has to become an anatomist, obviously, but getting to know, having those light bulb moments like, oh, that impingement in my shoulder, that's my supraspinatus tendon getting crunched, you know, that's yeah. that light bulb moments for people who aren't in the field and aren't anatomists, I think are a big deal and change the way they use their bodies. Be your own healer. Be your own healer. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for talking with us. Thank you so much. And again, for those of you who are watching, I'm going to link to it in the post, but uh, he's the creator of the core walking program. I always want to call it core walking method, core walking program, oh. which I was a very early 
guinea pig for and was a big fan of fan of back then. I'm sure it's evolved a lot since then as well. And if you're really wanting to know more about so as so as release party is a great book and also best title ever. And you have the piriformis sciatica syndrome book as well. A lot of people really suffer with that and uh, don't need to. It's one of those things that in my opinion is really resolvable and agonizing when you don't resolve it. So that's a useful resource too. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Brooke. Always a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.